What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Built for the Pursuit podcast. This week, we have a dude who I've, uh, I'm have i impressed with, Bob. I'm, I'm actually really, really <laughs> impressed with, not just because he can like bench a lot and carry a lot and would be like the best pack mule if you were going elk hunting. Like, you would just <laughs> want to bring him along just to like carry stuff. So, Joe Burham, Whitetail Fit, welcome to the show. What's going on? Appreciate you guys having me. Thanks yeah. for having me on. This, this has been a long time coming. Yeah, so I met you for the first time uh, at TAC, which, I mean, awesome events. I actually met, like, your brother and your whole team was kind of there shooting TAC in oh, Utah. Yeah. TAC, is, I mean, what do you think of TAC? I, that was my first one ever, and it was a ball. Man, it, it is so much fun. TAC has been kind of a staple for me the last, what, gosh, I started going to TAC in 20, I believe my first TAC was 2016, and I've gone to TAC every year since, so um multiple tacks every year since usually i hit the utah tack the south dakota tack and now they've opened up the oklahoma tack mm -hmm. um, which i know bushnell went to last year i'm not sure if you weren't there at the oklahoma tack were you no i was actually invited to go but i didn't work for the company yet and they're like <laughs> hey i know your first day is like in four days but it, like would you want to go tomorrow and i'm like no no i wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but otherwise the uh, the Utah Tack is is a blast. I know you've experienced that, and um, total archery challenge in general is just such an awesome way to hone your archery skills, know what's going wrong, what, and know what's going right with your equipment, knowing what you have to fix. Because there's a lot of uh, steep angle shots, there's a lot of long shots, there's a lot of like weird. You have to shoot over a limb to hit the target, but your arrow trajectory, like you'll clear the limb if you're, if you're holding right. And so there's a lot of stuff like that, that applies directly to a hunting scenario. And that's why I like hack so much. It's just like, you get to actually experience the type of shots that you will see in a hunt. So, yeah. um, that's, like I say, that's one of my biggest factors for tack is most of the tacks lead right up to the hunting season. So mm -hmm. you're just dialed and on point by the time you get into your hunting season. So and Bob, yeah, I love you, those events. Bob, have you been to a tack? I meet? haven't been. It sounds like from what you guys are telling me, I need to save up for a couple more years. I, like I would lose a lot of arrows. <laughs> See, so, that's, and uh, that's the thing. Like <laughs> you do, you do lose a lot of arrows. I will say that that's, that's, I don't care how good of a shooter you are at some point, you're going to break some arrows. You're going to, you will break some. And, and I had a couple where it was, I mean, it was my fault. I misranged. I mean, it hits cause there'll be grass in front of targets and you can't tell, well, is that grass 15 yards in front of the target? Or is it like, it's just tough to tell. And I lost a couple errors, but I will say tack is it's intimidating, right? Cause there's a bunch of people yeah. and you don't want to look stupid. And, but there's literally dudes that carry like a hundred arrows. Like, okay. I mean, they're, <laughs> yeah. they have like back quivers full of arrows. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I went up with a dozen and then by the end of the day, I had eight. You know what I mean? Something <laughs> like that. Bad. Like, yeah. Right. But yeah. so you're not going to, I mean, everybody talks like you're going to break like a million arrows and it's like, I might oh, be the backpack guy. I don't know. Well, no, I think yeah. you'd be the eight arrow quiver on your bow. You know what I mean? Something like that. Well, where, it, yeah. it also depends on if you're shooting. So we'll go out, we'll shoot all three days. We'll shoot a course in the morning. We'll come back in the evening, shoot a course in the evening after one o'clock when the lifts open back up. So we'll shoot five or six courses on a weekend. So over five or six courses, you might, <laughs> oh yeah, you might break eight or ten arrows. <laughs> well, and then by by then I'm gonna, my backpack isn't gonna be full of arrows. It's gonna be full of snacks because <laughs> they're not fast. You know, I mean, it, it does. It takes a long time to shoot a course, and it's super yeah. fun, super super fun. But it does take a while. And I know Montana. I might go to Oklahoma because it sounds a lot flatter than Utah was. Yeah definitely so. is oklahoma is uh it's a lot flatter there's a lot more um shots where they're really utilizing the trees and the brush and like oklahoma there seems to be a lot more arrows racking off trees and getting buried into stumps than utah but utah there seems to be a lot more like longer shots um i believe oklahoma like on one course in oklahoma if you have a target over 100 yards um, that's like pretty good in Utah. Most courses you're going to have three, four, maybe five targets over a hundred on a single course, depending on which course you're shooting. So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's just difference in terrain, uh, but they make the shots, they still make it challenging. So I guess that's why they call it total archery challenge. Maybe, right. uh, well, the good thing, I don't know, maybe I'm not a, 
uberly competitive person when it comes to like 3D stuff. Like, I, I mean, I like knowing how I did or whatever if I'm at my local one. But at that at TAC, you don't keep score at all. And it's like, it's 100% yep. just a warm up. So there isn't just a, a big, uh, it's not a big contest. Let's put right. it that way. It's not like you're going out there to like win. It's like you're competing against yourself. You yeah. want to meet the, or your squad or whatever. You I mean, I saw guys doing a dollar a target or something, just like you would in golf or whatever. So, but it does make it, it makes it fun. It is a great warm up and it, uh, it gets you in a little shape before the season actually starts. So. Yep, absolutely. And I think that's, that's what's fun about total archery challenges. There's not the pressure of, of the competition side in terms of the whole scheme of the shoot. So a lot of people, sometimes you go to a shoot and if you're not like a high level shooter, a lot of guys get drawn away from the tournament side and like your 3d tournaments that you go to where you're trying to place a good score. And you know, you, you kind of get in your head on those type of shoots. These shoots are just fun, man. You just, you're lobbing arrows. You're some of the targets, like, like I say, some of the targets, you could be the best archer ever. And you're still just, if you hit foam, we're good. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, you're kill shooting. shot or not. Right. Yeah. Just gotta and, hit the target. And you're shooting to kill, right? Like you're shooting yeah. to put it behind the shoulder. Like I'm not, I'm not aiming for a tan. You know what I mean? On some of those targets where they right. are kind of a wonky, kill, like a, a scoring zone. I'm just shooting to kill. I'm putting it right behind the shoulder or whatever on a snake or whatever kind of crazy stuff they usually have out there. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. where's the shoulder on the snake? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, let's dive in a little bit. Like, how did you even get your start in the hunting industry? Man, so I've always, obviously, I've, I've, I've always had a love for hunting and the outdoors. I started hunting when I was about, 12 years old and um i started bow hunting right away uh the only animals i've killed with a rifle have just been the past recent years um i never started rifle hunting i just started bow hunting and uh so got into bow hunting at an early age just a hobby that i picked up just i found it interesting um and i didn't even know anybody who bow hunted until i was maybe 15 or so and uh then i started bow hunting with my buddy wes wright which you guys are probably somewhat familiar with wes he was in my squad when we came to uh total archery challenge yeah. there but he uh mm -hmm. he was a big bow hunter uh met him at church and it was like man you bow hunt it's like yeah i bow hunt you know the funny thing is the age discrepancy when i was 15 wes was probably 19 or 20 like he was going into college like dental school and stuff like that but didn't care at all it was just like you bow hunt i bow hunt let's bow hunt together you know <laughs> and typically you don't see like a 15 year old hanging out with a 20 year old other than going bow hunting right, right. so he would drive us around and we we had all these spots here at home and we we were just having a ball bow hunting whitetail but so i've always been very very involved in hunting and very passionate about hunting and come 2016 is when i started the whitetail fit brand in the channel and um it was just a way of of sharing my hunts i was videoing my hunts prior i think 2014 2015 i filmed those seasons and i just started like getting used to filming getting used to the storytelling and i really really enjoyed it because i'd bring it home and i'd show like my family at that time nobody in my family hunted so i bring it home and i'm like man check this out you know it's i went and did this hunt and it was I saw this, this doe came in right below me, you know, and it's got a shot on her. And it's like, my family had a really good time watching those videos. I had a good time filming it. You know, I was like, man, I bet other people would enjoy watching this. And I wanted to just spread, like, I was so passionate about hunting that I wanted to spread, like, you guys can do this too. Like, it's not, it's the barrier to entry can be kind of daunting if you don't know anything about hunting. But if you share it in a light that's like, hey, you know, here's how you get set up with a bow. Here's how, you know, you find tracks for whitetail. Here's how you scout. You know, this is a scrape. This is a rub. So I started just telling the story of like, how do you hunt? And past that, I just like really, really enjoyed it. Started sharing all my content and uh, it kind of just took off from there. And, and I met some people in the industry who are just amazing people i don't know if you guys are familiar with hush um eric chesser and and those boys yeah. out in utah but they're mm -hmm. a big youtube channel out there in utah and eric kind of took me under his wing like right away i met him at total archery challenge the first total archery challenge i ever went to 
and I'd been watching his videos on YouTube. I was like, man, here, here's this guy who's producing all this content and I really enjoy it. And that, you know, you kind of look up to those people. Right. So it's, I went there with, with this, like, Oh my gosh, Eric, you know, it's so nice to meet you. I, I watch all your videos, you know, kind of fanboying over them. And, uh, he was like, man, have you ever done shed hunting? I'm like, I mean, just for whitetail, you know, not, I've never gone elk shed hunting or anything like that. And right there on the spot after a conversation, we had like a 10 minute conversation. Eric's like, dude, here's my number. Come out to Utah this spring. Let's do a shed hunt. Let's go find some elk sheds. So I flew out to Utah that spring. We went and did a shed hunt and that just lit a fire under me for the YouTube side and and the content creation side. Cause obviously here's a guy who, who has been doing it and they have a huge following. They know what they're doing. And it was just really, really cool to learn a lot of that stuff from Eric. And so I owe a lot of like my first early push to Eric, just being, you know, so open and, and honest and, and uh, inviting me to come on a shed hunt. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, here's this guy that I'm, you know, fanboying over. And he's like, come out and let's do some YouTube content. <laughs> so that kind of, that kind of started my, trajectory if you will and then ever since then i've just i've i've dove in deep and um kind of spread my wings with it and really really honed in on what's important to me what i feel like is important to the viewers uh and sharing content that i love that's the biggest thing is sharing content i'm passionate about um which is archery bow hunting i mean all of the above fitness so yeah that's kind of how i got started and then to where i'm at now like i say i've just taken it last several years and just ran with it. Yeah. I mean, when you think of words that would describe you, I think bow hunting and fitness would be like the exact ones that would be like you're describing. If there was a picture of you, that'd be the ones that I would pick. So when it, when you talked about filming a little bit, cause I was a, I was a camera guy for 12 years and whatever. And I had started on a, just a Sony handy cam, you know what I mean? Like it had yep. tapes and you had to record it and then you had to dub it to a computer and it was a huge pain. How did you kind of get your start? I mean, you kind of, it sounded like you're a self-made guy. Like you didn't have anybody teaching you how to film. You just kind of did it. Yep. Yep. So the first camera I ever ran was, I'm not even going to say what it was. Cause I'm not, sh I can't, it might've been a Sony or something, but it recorded, it recorded onto like tiny little discs. It was like, uh, like, they a DVD. like micro CDs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so it recorded onto that. And then I had like this old botched laptop that could barely, it could barely handle like 720 playback. So, editing on that was not the greatest so i was like well i need to get another something digital that i can record onto sd cards and i think i went to walmart and i bought a uh a canon vixia it was like the hf 600 or something it was kind of like just an hd handy cam mm -hmm. um i'm not even sure if it could record 4k at that time probably but not. that's kind of what i started on it was just like a handheld camcorder I think it was like 200, 250 bucks. And uh, so I, I come from a construction background. So prior to doing this full time, so now White Tail Fit Brands is my full time career. Prior to that, I worked um, construction for 13 years. So in that, I learned welding. Um, I've, I've worked on mechanics since I was like, I don't know, 14. I've been working on cars. Um, so I had some, you know, handy, uh, trades, if you will. And my first camera arm ever, I actually welded up. I took <laughs> one inch by one inch, uh, tube steel. It was square tube steel. I went to Ace Hardware and I bought some like, uh, like ceramic bushings to put between it. So it would be quiet, drilled holes through it, bolted it, wing nutted it. Um, I welded a plate with like lag screws coming off the backside with two little, uh, two little chain links that I could run a strap through to get it around a tree. And that was my first camera arm. It was hilarious. Like, so it was super it light. It weighed probably <laughs> yeah. 20 pounds. I mean, it was so heavy, but it was, but I could get it strapped to a tree and I could, I, I, I used, I used a Bushnell wind mount or a window mount. So like oh, a uh -huh. mount that would yeah. go on a window. I used that on the end of one of the, uh, it was a one by one piece of square steel on the end of it. I clamped, <laughs> I clamped a window mount on that with like a fluid head, if you want to call it a fluid head and put that little camcorder on it. And that was my first camera arm. And that was my first like real camera 
filming my hunts and i think i got like two kills on that system <laughs> i was just like all right i probably need to upgrade i think i went and bought a fourth arrow car uh fourth arrow camera arm like the next season very novice very yeah. new just wanted to do it and and tried everything i could that you know worked and somehow it kind of worked <laughs> yeah well we're actually gonna it, it, we actually uh, have our patent department working on that camera arm now so we're actually gonna steal that from you thank you <laughs> <Perfect. laughs> so, so filming we actually met your brother while we were out in utah and he kind of filmed for you it sounded like full time this year super funny guy super personality you almost need to get him in front of the camera more because he's such a funny little like i mean he's, I he's a character for sure i mean i think the first time i met him he was in like a sailor's hat like just he was oh, yeah. shooting just shooting and he had like a sailor's hat on just wandering <laughs> around just a goofy yeah. guy but he was hilarious and he did it like you made it sound like he was like oh he's kind of a novice filming then i look at your stuff i'm like that's not novice filming like that's that's really yeah. really good filming so he did a great job yeah. this, this season for you yeah he did an incredible job the nice thing is you know ethan is a when he gets his mind on something he's gonna figure it out point blank and period like it is it he has his mind to it. He's going to figure it out. He's going to figure out all the controls. He's going to figure out lighting. He's going to figure out, you know, your frame, how things need to look, arrow flight. You know, he, he's thinking about all of that stuff because the second he gets into something new, he puts all his time and effort into it and he learns very, very fast. And, um, you know, prior to that, I've been self-filming since 2016 up until this last fall. So, um, during the total archery challenge that was kind of i guess his first you know the previous total archery challenges we'd kind of hand the camera back and forth and i'd kind of be like you know point it down this lane just touch the screen it's on autofocus make sure that you touch the target it'll focus on the target then that'll get the shot i already had all the settings mm -hmm. where i needed it i just handed the camera off now this year Ethan was taking care of all the settings. He was taking care of all the framing and he did a really, really good job. And so this fall actually driving back from that Utah total archery challenge, um, we had some conversations about like, you know, cause Ethan was wanting to get more into the filming and the photography side just to learn more. He just, he wanted to know more about it. And so he's like, well, you know, what if I came along with you on the hunts this fall? And I'm like, dude, that would be, huge because I've, I've had in the past the last two years prior i've had interns lined up to come film on the fall hunts and every year like two weeks before the elk hunt was you know the elk hunts typically the first hunt if not the mule deer or the antelope hunt but where i really wanted the help was on the elk hunt and two years prior two weeks before i'd have my interns fall out and it's like oh i'm going and doing this thing and i can't blame them they had great opportunities um elsewhere so but i just kept having these interns fall out so i'm like man this is getting like do i just go full bore you know solo hunter style and self-film everything or do i keep trying to look and, and find somebody and when ethan had brought that up i was like you know what if you want to come like don't offer you're more than welcome to <laughs> we'll t you know inside and out of camera you know he'd already been learning at that point the total archery challenges he was doing a great job on video so it was like heck yeah dude come along so his first ever um film with me actual hunting film was uh, the antelope hunt in western nebraska this last fall and everything he just did a great job he stocked the the stock was intense. It was one of those stocks where it's like, you stay right behind me. You don't move a muscle left or right. Like you stay down flat to the ground. When it comes time for the shot, I'm going to tell you, you come up over the shoulder and, uh, he killed it. He did a great job, you know, and then past that, he came and filmed the elk hunt, um, which I just dropped on the YouTube channel. The last video from that elk hunt is a three part series. We hunted 14 days in Colorado. Um, and then he came along, filmed, you know, 80% of my whitetail hunts. So he did a great job. He's He's been killing it, and he's been a, a huge asset for sure on the video creation side. Yeah, well, you kind of just killed all my questions for like the last little bit. Like, hey, how was your hunting season? Well, you just kind of <laughs> gave it all away. <laughs> but you did. I mean, you had a great hunting season. Realistically, you, you did what? Antelope, mule deer, elk, whitetails in what? Nebraska, Kansas, Georgia. Like, yep. where all did you hunt this year? 
Yeah, so I hunted, uh, I started the season out in western Nebraska for antelope. That's kind of the, that's kind of the first hunt every year for me, just because our season for antelope opens in August. It's like second or third week in August it opens. So most all my other hunts, other than, you know, if I have like a Utah mule deer tag, sometimes that can be an August season. And it just depends on priority. If I have that tag, I'm going to go to Utah. Um, but typically I'll start the season out with antelope, Western Nebraska. So that was the first hunt. Ethan killed a great goat, um, just a stud typical the year prior, he had killed a really, really wacky non-typical that like its horns came down pretty much over its eyes. Super crazy looking thing. Like, like a devil looking buck. It was Mm. wild. The the craziest looking non-typical I've ever seen in an antelope. Um, and then this year he shot a really nice, uh, just typical pronghorn. Uh, I shot a doe, which again, any antelope with a bow spot and stock, I'm taking that opportunity. I love antelope meat. Um, a doe tastes just as good as a buck and they're all hard to kill. So if not better, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If not better. So, um, had a great antelope hunt starting out the season. Ethan had to go back home and get some work done. He does flooring for a living. And, uh, so he went back home, got some work done. I came back out September 1st is our deer opener in Nebraska. And, uh, I hunted eight days. I killed an absolute giant mule deer, um, spot and stock in a standing cornfield. Wild story. I'd been watching this buck all week long. I'd scouted him prior, um, prior to coming out to the Utah total archery challenge. We made a trip and stopped in Western Nebraska to get some scouting done. And so I'd had video of this buck in the summer in velvet with all his buddies. And, and it was just like, man, I, if I could kill this deer, like it'd just be incredible. Ended up hunting them. There was like four bucks that were all shooters and, uh, watched this deer. I glassed this deer walk into a, uh, standing cornfield and got a hold of landowner. Cause I didn't have permission in that cornfield. I, I was hunting the adjacent property, called the landowner. I'm like, Hey, this buck, just walked into your cornfield is there any way you know i could go in there and spot and stock this is western nebraska flat flat ground pivots you know standing corn uh and he's like yeah heck yeah he's like get in there get that deer out of that corn <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> sweet so got permission just on a phone call went in there and uh ended up stalking into that corn i'd looked on onyx from a topical standpoint how the pivot runs you could see over the years where like there's one spot where that pivot had leaked a lot. I don't know why they haven't taken care of it, but it looks like where that pivot might have leaked for several years or whatever, maybe the center pivots, I don't know, something was going wrong with it, but there was like a big bushy uh, grassy area in the middle of this pivot that you could see on the maps. I'm like, I bet he's betting right there, like right where all that grassy terrain connects with all this standing corn just every year it seems to grow up like that so went and stalked in there got close to where that grassy little patch was and i kicked this mule deer out of his bed at like five yards i couldn't see him he was the nick he was like the next row over from me and he jumps up out of his bed and and just caught just scared the crap out of me runs down like 10 yards and he stops and he's he's in the in the next corn row over now Mind you, this is early September. The corn is still green. It's not crunchy. I had the wind in my favor. The wind was blowing pretty decent. So the corn was moving. So like my movement was pretty well concealed. I'm full camo head to toe. I made my own like little ghillie hat. I took like, um, I took like blind material and cut it up and super glued it all over my hat. So my hat, like the wind was blowing with the ghillie material on my hat. It was just a perfect scenario for this deer not to pick me off. (laughs) And so he stood there for about 10 minutes and he's just, you know, he's doing that head bob. He's looking, he can't figure me out. I'm in the next corn row over. I have no shot. I'm like, he's got to step into my corn row for me to make anything happen. And so we're just having this stare down. He finally, I could tell he's flicking his ears. He's letting his guard down. He shakes his head. I'm like, dang, that's a big deer, you know? And he turns and he steps right into my, my lane, my corn row. And I'm the second he turns, I'm already full draw and I'm holding. I'm like, dude, he's inside 20, like clean inside 20. So I just, I buried my 20 yard pin right where I wanted it 
shot broke, absolutely smoked him. He ended up being 16 yards, just clean broadside and just couldn't have worked any better. It was no like, doubt. I couldn't have wrote that out in a script if I wanted, you know, it was just one of those hunts that was just like, man, all the stars aligned, you know? So, um, just an incredible experience. The farmer came out, helped me load the deer into the truck. It was just like, it was so fun. Jeez, Such a what, fun that's hunt. Awesome. So that's what dreams are made of right there. I mean, seriously. to just, you just had that happen to you and it's like, man, that's what, that's what you read like outdoor life for is stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Because it's yeah. like, that'll never it happen to me. It was one of those stories. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And you had the farmer come out and help you load it and everything. Yep. I mean, what a guy, you know, bad farmers make the best places to hunt. And so, I mean, like he had the leaky well and, and, it's kind of cool that you use Onyx and and the maps to figure all that stuff out too. Because realistically, yep. you got a hundred acre cornfield of of standing green corn. Where do you even start? I mean, he could bed anywhere, and it's like, well, you knew that grass spot was there, and you made the the educated guess to go there, and paid off for you. So, yep, isn't that the one yeah, you were so sleeping in the back of your truck by like a grain bin and stuff too? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, that hunt. Yeah, no, <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> yeah, I had a so that hunt was it's kind of similar area to where my, um, antelope camp is. So my antelope camp and my mule deer camp are pretty much the same camp. It's just the properties are like another 20, 30 minute drive one way or the other kind of hmm. thing. Um, so yeah, I've got a, uh, uh, he's a family member, distant family member who owns that farmstead where I camp. And it's literally just like, he, he parks trucks and trailers there when he's farming, but otherwise it's an abandoned farmstead. So it's just like, there's an old barn. Uh, there's a couple old silos, stuff like that. And I just park my truck. I, I pop up like a little, I have like a little Walmart awning that didn't last three, four days. I had a thunderstorm come through and just absolutely rip that thing to shreds. <laughs> but then I camp in the back of my truck with a canvas cutter. It's a good time, man. It's just, deer camp is one of those it's one of those hunts where it's like nothing special about it nothing fancy it's just sleeping in the back of your truck scouting deer day and night hoping you get an opportunity and and gosh it all came together on that hunt for yeah, sure I mean, so what a good that I mean, was a fun one. super nice family member to let you like sleep at his uh his his little homestead there yeah. But just not nice enough to let you stay in his house. Like, <laughs> well, if I had to stay in his house, I'd have to drive another forty-five minutes the oh, other yeah. way. So. That's not that's <laughs> not worth it for sure. That makes sense. So, oh dang, am I getting a little thumbs up? I don't know how, but yeah, you were. Oh, look at that! That's fancy. God, you wow. were just technologically that's the new iPhone thing. I think. Oh, nice. That's funny. That's funny. So, okay. So like off season stuff now, obviously it's off season stuff. What do you, are you doing anything for whitetails or anything? Do you, do you go put out salts or minerals or anything and go, I mean, obviously just shed hunting. Yep. Yep. So I will right now I've pulled pretty much all of my cameras off of my main areas that I hunt, um, replacing all the batteries in my cameras. I'll probably put out another, I might put out like two cameras on, on the main spots just to, just to see how the herd health is doing. What are the numbers looking like? I'm not looking for any particular bucks. Obviously they're starting to shed right now. I just want to get an idea of like, what's the deer density in the area. Um, and so in Nebraska, you can't bait during hunting season. Like you can't put corn out or anything. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's some law with like within 200 yards of where you're hunting or whatever. I don't even mess with it. I just don't put anything out during hunting season but come off season, you can feed. So you can put corn out, you can put mineral out, whatever you want in the off season. Um, but being that I hunt those same pieces of ground, I try and stay away from mineral because mineral can soak into the ground. And then it's like, well, technically come hunting season, if that mineral is still in the ground, that's technically still a bait site and I can't hunt within 200 yards of it. So I stay away from the mineral side of things, but I will go out and put just like whole corn on the ground, um, like alfalfa, stuff like that, that I know can get consumed and it's not going to stay there. Um, so I'll go and put corn out. I'll put a couple cameras on that corn just to check and see what the herd health is like, what the numbers look like. Also, when you put corn out, I'm putting it on like my south facing slopes where I know the deer are going to be bedding. My main bedding areas, those grassy knobs that are south facing slopes uh, where you might have like cedar trees uh, cover from the wind, stuff like that. That's where I'm going to put that corn out, put the cameras out. A lot of times the deer will come and feed around there right now they're shedding. So 
you might pick up a few more sheds if you put the feed where they're bedding. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just helps the deer not have to work quite as hard to supplement that feed. They don't have to travel quite as far to get to feed that, you know, right now the, the cut corn fields are pretty well picked over. So those deer, once they get to the cornfield, they're not really staying in one spot. They're moving all around that whole, that massive egg field trying to find feed because there's not much feed left in the cut corn. So right. um, you're kind of just helping supplement that feed a little bit, keep the stress low. A big thing with, with keeping your deer herd healthy is keeping the stress levels low. So um, I don't like to go in there and hike around too much until I know that those deer are like in a good spot where the winter isn't super harsh. So I won't even really start shed hunting until the weather starts to get a little bit warmer, which we've had uh, some warmer weather this past week, two weeks. Uh, and it looks like it's going to continue to get a little bit warmer. So, um, around this time, probably once I get back from Alabama and Tennessee, I've got a couple trips coming up, then I'll start shed hunting a lot harder. But when, when the temperatures are like crazy cold, weather's crazy, we had, you know, 12 to 16 inches of snow back. I'm sure you guys did too, down mm -hmm. there in Kansas city, but we had a ton of snow back here like three weeks ago, that's the time I'm definitely going to stay out of there. I'm going to leave all the pressure. Like I'm not giving those deer any pressure whatsoever, letting them do their thing. Um, and, uh, just supplemental feed with that, just corn and alfalfa stuff like that. So yeah, knowing you, you probably put 50 pound bag. You don't even drive there. You probably put 50 pound bags of corn on your back <laughs> and just walk in. It just <laughs> depends, on. depends on which property, the one property I load, I load the four wheeler down to max capacity and I yeah. drive that sucker in there. But if it's property where I can't get a four wheeler in, then yeah, I've got to hike them in. Yeah. Duh. Why wouldn't you? Right. So uh, <laughs> yeah. that kind of like your training stuff, getting into kind of the fitness side of it. So I mean, what's your training sessions like in the off season versus how do you stay in shape during deer season? Because I mean, me, I'm not exactly like the most fittest guy because I sit in a tree stand all the time. But as a as a a guy that when you hunt all the time, most of the time you it's gas stations, it's late nights, early mornings. You're eating dinner at eight o'clock at night and going right to bed because you got to go and do it again. So how do you kind of base your off season stuff to your in season stuff to even like your diet? Yeah. 100%. Okay. So we'll start with like where we're at right now. We're postseason right now. So we're looking at February, um, January, depending on if I go to Arizona or not, typically January is like my last hunts, right? Mm -hmm. So I get done with my hunts and then I really start focusing back at like my home gym where I have a routine and I have everything at my disposal on the road. It's hard because you might have a gym while you're traveling, you know, in a small town that you can go in and pay like a daily rate to get whatever to work out for that week that you're there. Um, or you might be at a buddy's house. Maybe he's got some free weights or something. You can go for a run, all that type of stuff. But it's it's not nearly as structured as where we're sitting right now, postseason. And I'm back home and I can be going to my regular gym here in Lincoln. Um, I go to a gym called Kratos. I'm sitting in the parking lot of it right now. But of course uh, just you an <laughs> exceptional gym here in Lincoln. So, um, but yeah, so how, how I structure my workouts throughout the year, it's all based on hunting. It's all based on getting into the peak physical shape come season. So, um, how my workouts look right now, I'm going to be putting on a little bit more muscle right now than I would towards say july august because that's when the hunts are starting in july and august i want my my cardio to be top notch i want endurance to be top notch i want my body fat percentage to be a little bit lower so i'm not carrying more weight than i have to and i want my overall body weight to be a little bit lower because again i i'm not a very big framed guy i'm like five foot seven right now i'm 165 so um, when I go into my hunting season, I want to be right about that 160 to 163 in that area is where I want to be come hunting season. Um, it's just my most efficient weight. And it's not necessarily so much the weight as it is the condition that I'm in at that weight. Um, the scale doesn't mean nearly as much to me. It, on, honestly, the scale means 
almost nothing to me. It's how I feel and it's how my conditioning and my um, cardio and endurance is at that time of year. So how my workouts look right now, coming out of hunting season, I'm almost on more of like a bodybuilding split where I'm looking to gain more muscle and target specific uh, muscle groups. So I'm doing like uh, like a back day, an arm day, a leg day, a chest day, that type of thing, shoulders, where I have these specific splits where I'm going to focus on that one muscle group on that specific day and the next day, the next muscle group, next day, the next muscle group. And it's, it's going to be more of like a bodybuilding split where I'm trying to put muscle weight on. Whereas come you know, the summer time frame, I start to really around May and June after like turkey season ends, May and June, that's when I really start ramping up more of my endurance and cardio work. So I'll do more of a not like strict CrossFit, but more of a CrossFit style workout where it's like you're keeping a high elevated 160, 150, 160 beats per minute heart rate throughout the entirety of your workout so you're you're keeping that elevated heart rate um being the whole duration of your workout to build that cardio to build that endurance and um then i'm starting to shed a little bit more of that body fat that i might have built up from now until may june so i'll probably by the time may and june comes around i'll probably be right around 175 so I'll I'll have built muscle, but I'll I'll have also put on a little bit of fat because I'm doing kind of like a little bit of a bulk to get that muscle back, right? Because I lose muscle weight during hunting season. There's no way, there's no two ways around it. It's just I burn so many calories during hunting season, especially the elk hunts, that it's really, really hard for me to keep after. I have a extremely fast metabolism. So it's like I have to constantly be eating and fueling my body in order to even maintain my weight. Otherwise I'll start dropping in weight. Um, so anyway, so I will build right now until like I say, May, June, then May, June comes around and I'll start to do more of those CrossFit style workouts, high heart rate, get that endurance, get that cardio in so that come like August when the hunts start, I'm sitting right back down around 165, but it's a more efficient 165 than I am right now. Like right now I'm at 165, but it's like, I've got a little bit more fat on me. My cardio and endurance is nowhere where it needs to be. I just came off of a hunting season that again, with the whitetail hunts, you're not, you're not um, having a consistent gym routine because you know, you might be in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, and they don't even have a gym anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, you're relying on hiking to get your cardio in, um, but you're not doing any strength work really. Um, so you're starting to lose a little bit of that muscle mass and you're eating not great. Like gas station pizzas. It's the only thing in town. It's mm-hmm. the only thing to eat. You can go to a gas station and get mixed nuts and stuff like that and try to eat healthy. But we all know that only lasts for so long. I'm human. I love food. Right. And, Hard to turn down. You know, Casey's thankfully, pizza. I have been blessed with that metabolism. I can eat quite a lot of junk food, and it really doesn't. It affects how I feel, but it it really doesn't affect like um my body composition too much. It's just if I eat a bunch of junk food, I feel like crap. I don't necessarily look terrible, but I feel like not great. So I do try to. I try to eat somewhat healthy where I can, but there's no two ways around it during hunting season. Like there's a little Debbie in my backpack. I (laughs) promise you that. (laughs) And some sour gummy worms, you know? So, but why why just one? um, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But come, come spring and summer, that's when I'm really trying to hone, hone in on my diet, hone in on the workouts and build my body to a point where I'm going to be peak efficiency come hunting season. That's the whole goal is, build in the spring, work that endurance and that cardio in the summer, then come, you know, that August, September timeframe, I'm in around that 165 to 170 pound range and just as efficient as I possibly can be. So if I go into hunting season after a bulk, like say, say I go through this first um, couple months and I get up to that 175 mark 
and I'm like, I'm heavy, but I'm not like, it's just like you're muscle heavy. That doesn't help you in the mountain. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't. If anything, your cardio is, de is deficient. Your endurance is deficient. You go into the mountains heavy and you start to cramp a lot more. Um, you just feel heavy. You can feel that extra weight when you're hiking. So like I say, when I'm hiking and I get towards the hunts, I want to be at that like peak efficiency. So that's how I structure all my workouts to get myself to the hunts where I'm at a hundred percent. Yeah. And I will say that like, I mean, I'm obviously not in the best shape, right? At this exact moment, but when I was filming, I mean, I did 12 years of, I mean, every year going to the Yukon for moose, going Colorado and Montana and Wyoming for elk and stuff. And the years that you didn't really work out and try, they sucked. That it was just miserable. And it's like, if you just put in you that little bit of effort and like, it made the hunt so much more enjoyable because it ain't like, like you just look at the next mountain range over and you're like, man, that's gonna suck. <laughs> like <laughs> it's, you're, you yeah. just, you just go into it. Just a negative mindset of like, you're just going to get beat. I mean, you're just literally going to get beat the whole time instead of being able to enjoy the moment of like, man, this is awesome. I mean, I'm in the mountains of Wyoming or Montana or wherever you are at that time. And, and it's so cool. Or you're just like, God, I can't wait to get back to the lodge because I want that little Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So I have to have motivation or be inspired or have a goal or something. You know what I mean? Something to build toward. And it usually revolves around hunting. You know what I mean? Because I'll, I'll know out a few years ago, I went to Newfoundland for caribou. And it was like, man, I need to shed a bunch of weight and get in shape for that or whatever. And it's like, that's kind of my thing is always trying to have a goal to build toward. If not, I'm just going to little Debbie, my ass off. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, <laughs> just you know, no other way about you know, it. And, and like you say, prime example, Ethan coming and filming on the elk hunt. So Ethan has always been active. He lays flooring for a living. Um, he's worked construction prior. He's done decking. He's a very active individual, but he hasn't been like really immersed in the gym per se. He has just been super active, right? Well, coming on the elk hunt, when we'd made that decision, he was going to come film. It was like, he went and got a gym membership at the YMCA. He started doing like the stair stepper, just trying to get into a little bit better cardio shape. And he did a great job on the elk hunt. He came in and, and I think more so than anything, it was his mentality mm -hmm. of like continuing to push forward. He told me, it was the, so we did the first leg of the elk hunt with Wes. He had five days to hunt and then I had to get him back to the airport. Um, or no, it was like six or seven days, something like that. Had to get him back to the airport. And then Ethan and I went to another unit. This was just over the counter Colorado elk. We went to another unit that was way higher in elevation where we hunted with Wes. The first five to seven days was like 8,000 foot of elevation at the highest and it was fairly rolling country it wasn't like extremely steep stuff it was a lot of brush country like oak brush country mm -hmm. you're just bushwhacking everywhere you're going um so that country was like a, a little bit easier hunt i guess a little bit easier physically because you weren't doing like the super steep peaks it was just kind of rolling country anyhow we drop West back off the airport, make the decision to go back out again to another unit. The other unit that I was scouting was like, we were starting at the trailhead at 9,000 and we were going to camp at 11,400 mm. within a four and a half mile hike. And we were going to hunt all the basins surrounding that peak. We we're going to camp basically spine of the peak that goes up and then we we're going to hunt the basins on the way down. And, uh, so anyway, I knew, and we were going to spike camp it, the, the trip prior, we were truck camping. We were just camping out of the truck and hunting, you know, from the truck type of thing, take the four wheeler, take the e-bike down the trails that we could. Otherwise we were hunting off the bikes, off the four wheelers. Um, and so that it was like going to that new spot where the elevation was way higher, way steeper. You're carrying a way heavier pack cause you're carrying five day spike camp on your back. Mm. And I knew that was going to be like another, a whole nother level from what we just came from. So Ethan and I were loading up the packs at the trailhead and getting everything ready. And the first push up the trailhead was like, it wasn't for very far, but it was like a pretty steep push the first, you know, half mile. And uh, anyway, I was just, you know, head down, just hiking, trekking, pull one after the other, just 
just keeping moving and stuff. And I'd stop every once in a while, look back. Ethan's back there filming, you know, I keep hiking and stuff like that. And we made it through the entire hunt. He did an excellent job. We took breaks where we needed to take breaks. We camped, we moved camp three different times. And uh, anyway, at the end of the hunt, so during the whole duration of the hunt, Ethan went down like two or three belt loops. He, he like lost probably 15 pounds on that last leg of the hunt. Wow. So <laughs> when we got, when we got off, we got back down to the trucks and stuff. I'm like, so how, how'd you like, I said, you did an awesome job. Like, how'd you like the hiking and stuff like that? He's like, I'll be honest. He's like, I wasn't going to say it right away, but he said that first hundred yards out of the truck, when we first took off the trailhead, it was like that first hundred yards, I was fighting demons. He mm -hmm. was like, I, w I was going to be like, Joel, I don't know. Like is a heavy pack, like whatever. Like he was in his head. He was trying to like talk himself maybe not out of it, but like, Hey, what are we doing? Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But he didn't meant, he didn't say a word. He didn't say a peep. He just put his head down and kept, kept moving. And I think that is like a huge testament to how much mentality plays on those Western hunts. Oh, like sure. if you have the mentality of, I'm just going to put my head down and grind. And he's like, I looked up and I see my little brother hiking in front of me. And it's like, I'm not going to say anything you know so it's it's one of those things he went through the hunt i didn't even know he was struggling like hmm. he did such a good job with the hunt i had no idea until after the entire hunt he's like man that first hundred yards out of the trail ahead he's like i was fighting demons kind of thing yeah and it's like dude you killed it yeah you did well, awesome yeah. you know it does sound so like anyway, he once he once he's he a got smart back, now he's oh sorry go ahead well i was gonna say he's a he's a smart camera guy is what he is he cut on quick because as camera guys, you just, hey, let me, uh, let me, let's slow down and take the shot right here. And then he'll do the shot and then he'll walk up to you and then show you the shot. Well, he just wanted two, yeah. he wanted two breaks is what he wanted. Like, he didn't give a damn about that footage. He just wanted a break. So he's smart. He is caught that, on quickly. That's the trick of the trade. Huh? Yeah. Uh huh. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, uh, that's funny. But no, I'm, and then, you know, getting back from the elk hunt, he still had that Y membership. He's been going to it and he's been absolutely crushing it. He's been running like, four miles every day he's been doing just awesome workouts he's got a goal that he's set and he's like five pounds off of that goal he's already lost 15 pounds like he's just killing it so it, it like I say a lot of it also is like mentality and drive and just if you put your head to something like i say with camera work he put his head to the camera work turns out he's a pretty dang good cameraman yeah. right nice. so anything with with that he does in life fitness business anything he puts his head down and he starts grinding he's got he's got an objective he's gonna meet it because he has that mentality and i think that is a huge factor when it comes to these western not only the western hunts the whitetail hunts as well it's funny because like my brand is whitetail fit right well when i started the brand i wanted to do something fitness and i wanted to do something with whitetail that whitetail is my number one game species if all other game species didn't exist i'd be fine i'd just go hunt whitetail so i wanted to start something that was like incorporating whitetail and fitness it wasn't i didn't start the brand to be like you have to be an ultra marathon runner like crazy in shape whatever to hunt whitetail it was i liked whitetail and i liked fitness so like whitetail fit now we have the brand now we're going to produce content it wasn't i was never gearing it towards like you have to be crazy in shape to hunt whitetail because honestly i know guys who are not in crazy shape and they're complete killers mm -hmm, like yeah. they know what the heck they're doing um but it, it helps definitely helps if you're doing if you're doing like kansas this year i made four different trips to kansas i keep getting this thumbs up <laughs> <laughs> i made uh four different trips to kansas this year all public ground all hanging hunts, you know, hunting off my back type of thing, going in, hanging a stand, taking the stand out, coming back out same day. And those type of hunts do grind. I mean, it's a grind. They wear on you for sure. And, um, you know, being in shape helps you get out of the bed in the morning, um, helps you go that extra mile, do that extra scouting, hang that extra stand, whatever it might be. It does pay off to be in good shape, mm -hmm. but I'm not saying you have to be in the best shape to kill whitetail. Cause obviously you don't on the Western hunts. I would say it's 
not impossible to do it when you're out of shape, but you're going to have a lot better time if you are in shape. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what is, I mean, 2024, what's it look like for whitetail fit? Like what do you have a, a go to, is Ethan going to film for you in 2024? Or is he going back to work to make some money and, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and not have to go chase you around the mountains? So what's 2024 look for whitetail fit? Yeah. So 2024, um, the thought is bring Ethan back on for the fall to, to film. And obviously we're going to be doing total archery challenges, local 3d shoots, mm -hmm. um, bow build videos, archery content, tips and tricks. Uh, I want to do a whole series on YouTube for beginner hunting. Um, there's been, I've had so many questions on the Instagram just regarding new hunters, like new hunters asking me questions about like, what's a scrape? Why do deer do that? You know? Mm -hmm. And so there, there's things that when we as hunters have been in it so long and we've learned all this stuff and we're like, sometimes I forget that like, it's not just common knowledge, um, you know, on why I'm placing my tree stand in a certain way. It's not common knowledge why I'm studying deer trails and, and deer movement during a certain time of the year that's all like some of that beginner hunting stuff that I'd like to touch on. So I want to do a, a YouTube series on the, on the kind of just the ba bare bones basics of hunting. Um, and then on top of that, obviously have all my Western hunts, my fall hunts, probably going to do Colorado again, um, over the counter elk. I have points built up in Wyoming, but I'm holding on to those points because there's a unit I really, really want to go back to. Uh, I hunted it just as a cameraman and uh, helped call for my buddy Wes back in 20, I think that was 2017. Mm -hmm. And we had like an insane hunt. It was like Jurassic Park. <laughs> it was just absolutely nuts. So I'm trying to, I don't know if that unit is still that way. I, I hope that it is. I hope that they've had good management in that unit. Um, so I'm holding on to my points in Wyoming for that we'll see what with point creep it's kind of moving off and they're doing a few things different out west now so i might burn it on a general tag next year who knows but this year i think i'm still just going to do over the counter colorado elk still do my antelope hunt do my western uh nebraska mule deer hunt i've got um a couple leads on axis deer i'd really like to hunt axis deer this year with my bow mm -hmm. whether that be in texas or hawaii i'm not sure um well, which she, route if you had your I'm others i mean let's be What's real that? i said if you have your others where would you i mean i think i'm going hawaii on that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah hawaii, hawaii would be the yeah that would be the uh the end all for sure but um i'm kind of weighing the options on price because if i go with like an outfit situation in hawaii it's going to be a little bit more expensive than the leads that I have in Texas. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's Hawaii would be the move for yeah, sure. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. That'd be an awesome one. Well, that sounds but, like, I mean, it sounds like you had a great schedule already kind of coming up for you. And you said Ethan yeah. is going to come back for you think this year. Yeah, I think so. If he'll hang with me, if he, if I didn't uh, burn him out too much last year, hopefully I didn't, <laughs> it didn't seem like it. I think, I think he had a good time and, you know, being brothers, it's like one of those things we spend, we're super close anyway. So we spend a ton of time together outside of hunting season. So yeah. when we spend that much time together in hunting season, it's, it's like your best, your best hunting partner is kind of like your wife. You know, you have to really get along with them to, mm -hmm. to spend that much time with them. And, uh, you know, Ethan being my brother, it's like, he's already in that category with family in terms of like, we know each other in and out. We know what's, you know, going to make him mad. He knows what's going to make me mad. We don't push those buttons. We just go along our, our, our merry way. So it was actually a really good dynamic having yeah. him around in the fall and, and, and knowing that I can tell him like, if there's something I don't, you know, with filming or what, or with, for me more so it's with like hunting. If there's something if there's something that I'm like, Hey, like stay direct on this stock, like stay directly behind me. I don't want a silhouette left to right, whatever. Um, Ethan's going to know and understand that I mean business in that situation more so than if I brought an intern on who doesn't know how to hunt at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to almost kind of feel bad, like talking to an intern the way I would with my brother, if that makes sense. Makes sense. Where yeah. it's yeah. like, you know, I don't want this situation. Cause like, I don't want this situation to go south because of something the cameraman did. And mm -hmm. I, 
like Ethan, Ethan knows when I'm like, Hey, let's do this. Ethan's gonna be like, done. It's, it's happening, you know, yeah. um, versus uh, there might be a little bit of a learning curve with, with an intern, which would be totally fine. Yeah. But uh, I just, I get kind of intense when I'm in the moment with hunts. Cause it doesn't yeah. happen very often with a bow. And uh, I think everybody, so does. I'm, I'm yeah. like hyper-focused. Yeah. I think everybody so, in that moment, I mean, you kind of see some true colors a little bit come out when it's like uberly like i mean it's the moment what are you gonna that's everybody gets a little things get a little tense yeah (laughs) yeah so all right so so got some rapid fire questions for you okay so we got four or five rapid fire questions okay so what what advice would you give to a a a novice hunter or a guy that's looking to get into archery what would you kind of tell them to start what would you try to what would be their your recommendations so my first thing would be go to an archery pro shop hang around there for a little bit, start asking questions. Most of the guys working on bows behind the counter are at least somewhat knowledgeable on archery. If, if they have a bow in a bow press, they probably know at least a little bit about the ins and outs of a bow. So start asking questions there. Um, your local archery club also is a good resource. If you already have a bow and you're, you're just looking for somewhere to shoot, your local archery club is going to be packed full of hunters, packed full of archers, um, like-minded people. The other thing is YouTube is a, I call it the YouTube university. Anything you want to learn on any subject, whether it's hunting, business, phys- fitness, any category, you can learn it on YouTube. There is so much content out there um, for novice hunters novice archers and that's why i wanted to do that series like i said on Mm -hmm. on kind of um bringing new hunters into hunting and and showing them what are the bare bones basics but there's a lot chris b does an incredible job with informational video levi morgan does an incredible job i've got videos on my channel that can definitely steer you in the right direction tips and tricks how to tie a peep site um how to tie d loop just simple simple stuff in archery that anybody can do um john dudley knock on he's got great informational content i mean there's a lot of stuff on youtube that people can can turn towards and learn from so yeah look towards the youtube university ask people who know um and just be open to learning have your ears wide open and and um take advice i would say from people who have reputable opinions um sometimes you can you know you if you get to talking to the guy at the bar about deer hunting and he's talking about shooting two three deer on one tag maybe don't take that guy's advice (laughs) (laughs) maybe maybe talk to somebody who you know is a reputable source inside the space if that makes sense yeah no makes complete sense okay so uh you talked a little bit about being in the outdoor industry for so long now who when you were kind of fanboy who was kind of the guy that you were looking up to you wanted to be like back in the in the old days? Who do, who was kind of your go-to guy you looked up to you wanted to be like and now you're kind of being like? Eric Chester, Cameron Haynes, Michael Waddell, Lee Lakoski, Jury Boys, Mark Terry. I mean, I looked up to all the, all the legends, all the greats. That was kind of, I mean, that was the, the content that I consumed, you know, on a daily basis. So those guys were definitely, um, pioneers in my book, you know what I mean? So, um, mm-hmm. uh, but definitely, definitely Eric Chester with the Hush crew. And, and like I say, what a pivotal moment for Eric to invite me out on a, on a shed hunt, just being a good dude, you know? So, right. but yeah, definitely those guys. Okay. So now that you've been in the industry, who's someone you would like to go on a hunt with? And you could have already went. Still Cam Haynes. Yeah. Cam Haynes, probably. So I've been on a hunt with Eric. I went on a hunt with Levi Morgan. Um, I've become really good friends with a a lot of these people in the industry who are just like incredible people. And, you know, they're they're just like everybody else. They love bow hunting. And, you know, that's right up my alley, too. So um, it's easy to make friends with people who who have that same mentality and mindset and and work ethic. Work ethic is a huge thing, too. And I see them in, in all of those guys. Um, but one guy who I have not hunted with, who I, I, I know him, I've met him many times, know him really well, Cameron Haynes. I've never hunted with him, but he's a guy that I would love to go elk hunting with. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we all would. Let's be real here. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, so uh, last question. So bucket list hunt. What do you kind of have on your bucket list hunt? We ask kind of everybody, and it ranges from from Africa to Alaska. What's kind of your bucket list hunt? So I have a couple. Can I have more than one? No, you get one bucket, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if I, if I had one, it would be, um, probably brown bear with a bow. Yeah. We've, we've heard that one. one. We've heard that one and we, we critique it every single time (laughs) because I mean, it's, it takes a lot of, uh, testicular fortitude to be at 40 yards and in with a a bow against a brown bear. That's a, I I remember there was a local, there was a local shop here that had a Kodiak brown bear when I was a kid and you looked up to it and it was like. I mean, it was taller than it's literally taller than a basketball goal, and it's like, I don't know that I could do that. Like that's a that's that's tough to do with a bow. Yeah, I think my my biggest uh, barrier to entry with that one, but it's just the cost of the hunt. It's mm-hmm. such an expensive one. <laughs> he literally, Joel just said, "Listen, I got the nuts. I don't have the money." Like, <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do it. I, I think I have that little bit of crazy in me that I would do it, um, and. You know, a lot of times with those hunts, I think always you have to have like your guide has a long rifle spitting right down the barrel at that bear. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where, you know, is it 100 percent safe? No, definitely not. But there you at least have some backup and and, you know, you know, the guides in that area like Cole Kramer. Have you guys ever heard heard of Cole Kramer? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So if you have a guy like Cole Kramer behind you, guiding you in a scenario like that, I would feel pretty safe. But I'd want to go with someone who's again who's reputable, who knows what the heck they're doing, Um, because it's not a it's not a faint you know faint of heart hunt. It is a it's a sketchy hunt. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I mean, we we talked about Mike Hunsucker from Heartland Bowhunter shooting that one off the ground, but then I watched a video like literally yesterday of I think it was Donnie Vincent who. He missed a brown bear twice on the ground at under twenty yards, and the guy ended up having to shoot it. Like, at, I mean, he was Jeez. he was like in the like teens walking at him, and I mean, teens walking at him that's like three steps for a ten foot brown yeah. bear. Like that's I mean, he's on you quick. So it ain't a, it ain't a for sure deal, no matter how good you are, because that that there has to be a lot of nerves and oh. I couldn't imagine. Yeah. So confidence in who's but behind you. But that's what we live for, man. We live for that adrenaline rush. We live for those experiences. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So, well, Joel, thanks so much for coming on. If we want to check out your stuff, where do we go? So anywhere, if you just Google Whitetail Fit, pretty much everything will pop up. But on the Instagram, it's Whitetail underscore Fit. Uh, my website is www.whitetailfit.com. Um, Everything else is just whitetail fit. So if you search it on YouTube, just type in whitetail fit, two words, everything will pop up. All right, awesome. And you just dropped some new clothing on your website, I heard. Yes, sir. Yep. I had a trade show here in Nebraska that I brought some new uh, some new designs to. So those designs are now on the website, um, just whitetailfit.com. You can grab yourself a hat, T-shirt, hoodie. Um, I even have like arrow wraps and veins, um, stuff like that for fletching. So Very cool. yeah, you can get it all, all on there. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for joining us and uh, good luck in 2024. And we'll come back and have to check out how your season went for you and uh, tell Ethan he's doing a great job and keep at it. Cause I mean, to make you look good, I mean, you got to have a good <laughs> camera guy. So, <laughs> exactly. so thanks exactly. so much, Joel. Appreciate we appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.